Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain here with my younger brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. Today we are continuing our three-part CME series on small cell lung cancer. In the second episode, we are going to focus on adverse events and management available on treatment options available here in extensive stage small cell lung cancer. And for this, we are excited to have Dr. Misty Shields from the Indiana University. Misty, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. Misty, welcome. Misty, in our first episode, we had a chance to touch on the current treatment landscape and the new data from ASCO 2025. Two back-to-back -back studies showing overall survival benefit here. I am Forte for Lurbanectidin and Atezolizumab, and Delphi for Terlatumab. But this is all coming at a cost, be it financial toxicity, side effects from the drugs, time toxicity, and some significant logistic challenges when we're talking about Terlatumab. Before we take a dive into some of these common side effects and how to manage these, is it fair to say that your treatment algorithm for extensive stage small cell lung cancer after ASCO 2025 in a patient with good performance status is going to be chemoimmunotherapy up front, then lorbanectidin immunotherapy as part of maintenance, and at the time of progressive disease, you'll lean into terlatumab? Yes, absolutely. So what an exciting year for ASCO here in 2025 to have these two amazing back-to-back you know, -back sessions uh, in the orals. Uh, you know, wonderful data, exciting, obviously, as you mentioned, with additional costs and logistics. So yes, I am automatically implementing these right as I got back from ASCO, you know, put a patient right on the Enforte regimen as they transition to maintenance immunotherapy. And absolutely, I think that the algorithm, as you outlined, is is completely accurate as to what I would do for my patients, you know, really addressing those logistics for tarlatamab, making sure it's fair and equitable access for all patients. But that is exactly the algorithm I would recommend for my patients who are, have extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Thanks for going over that, Misty. And uh, yet again, uh, exciting times. We have seen overall survival benefit here, as Rahul stated, and any overall survival benefit in this unfortunate disease is a win. Uh, starting off with M Forte here with lorbinexidine and immunotherapy, can you touch on some of the common side effects that we see here and some clinical pearls around this? Though we have some experience with lorbinexidine because this was being utilized in second line prior to being used That's here good. in maintenance therapy. And also while you're going over side effect profile, there is some overlap that is seen with IO as well. How do you decide which one is causing those side effects and how do you maneuver through that? This is such an important point. So uh, as you mentioned, we had experience from the original study with the basket trial with lorbinectinin showing an objective response rate of 35% for patients, you know, automatically uh, solidifying its place as a, an option for relapse small cell lung cancer with superior response rate over topotecan that has been historically used. So yes, we do have experience with it, you know, um, as Dr. Pazarez presented at ASCO. The hematologic side effects are, you know, to be anticipated and expected. What we saw with uh, the addition of of lorbanexidin to a tezolizumab and forte with that uptick of hematologic side effects, no surprise there. But you should really be cautious, and whenever you're thinking about this regimen, then the addition of GCSF for patients who are receiving lorbanexidin to prevent that neutropenic fever. You know, there was not a, a large signal of it, but again, it was showing that aggressive supportive care up front and helping patients, you know, counseling them, selecting them, and ensuring that they have good hematologic reserve, putting them on this regimen. And then, Missy, going through some of those overlap side effects, be it through IO or lubinectidin, we can see some uh, liver toxicities. How are you deciphering which one's coming which? Are you going to stop immunotherapy, lubinectidin, both? Day to day in your clinic, what are you doing? Yeah, so you're really wanting to um, watch those liver function tests, really with a, a, an emphasis on the, the bilirubin there, but not as much as in the, the pan transaminases that we would expect with hepatotoxicity from immunotherapy. So really being able to tease out whether you see a cholestatic pattern or a transaminase pattern or a mixed pattern, that should help you with that immune toxicity. Again, also, if you're seeing fevers or other concerns for other immune-related adverse events that may help you with the deciphering whether this is a, an IRAE or a lorbinectinin or a combination. Again, you know, being careful with patients who may have liver metastases or underlying liver disease, um, you know, things like cirrhosis that you really want to be paid close attention to, close monitoring and, and checking in often with your patients. And I know you touched on the growth factors. You're someone who uses Trilocyclib heavily in your practice up front. 
this is something that I've not really adopted in my practice for all my patients. But if someone is on trilocyclic, when you switch to maintenance, lurbanectidin and atezo, do you switch this to growth factors or is it safe to continue with trilocyclic at this time? So as much as I would love to continue the trial cycle, we haven't studied that just yet. And I, as you mentioned, I am a huge proponent of it. I do utilize trial cycle in my patients here in clinic. It's meaningful. It's real. We see multiple phase two studies showing it has benefit across multi-lineage for hematologic toxicities and really helping patients reduce those toxicities such as um, you know, neutropenic fever or hospitalizations that are very meaningful and dose delays and dose disruptions. And so, um, you know, it is important, but the label is the label. And so we have to follow how the original studies were utilized. And that was in the pre lorbenectin and maintenance era. And so I do switch my patients to a GCSF approach whenever I uh, come to the role of um, lorbenectin in the maintenance phase. Before we switch on this topic of trilocyclib, with regards to utilizing this uh, approach, do you use trilocyclib in all your patients uh, or rather only on high risk patients? So that's an important uh, point. So I do use it in all patients. The only patients that I hesitate to use it on are patients who may have day two and day three PO or oral BID uh, toposide. In that case, I use it in the first day and I don't offer it in those second and third days because it's given 30 minutes prior to each dose of chemotherapy. Perfect. And what you touched on that we have some comfort around lubronectidin because we've been using this in second line. But when it comes to terlatumab, I really think out in the community, this is something that we need to get more comfortable with, even though we're using bites for hematologic malignancies. Misty, can you touch on how are you partnering up with your community oncologist around this drug and managing that CRS upfront with the first few doses? Yeah, absolutely. So this is important. What an exciting option for patients to have tarlatumab, this bi-specific T-cell engager against DLL3 and CD3 for relapsed small cell lung cancer showing superiority in second line and beyond for small cell lung cancer. And so access to this should be equitable and fair. And so working with your community oncologist to make sure that they're, you know, considering referrals to you if they don't have access to it, if they have any um, concerns or feel uncomfortable managing it, that's what we're here for is to help support, uh, to provide the best care for patients, whether that's um, at our center, at their center, or in some combination. So, you know, really making sure that, um, you know, if, it, you know, phoning a friend if, if you need help, um, you know, there's a lot of um, academic oncologists who have access to this medication um, and have used it, such as myself, um, that are willing to help. And so with that, you know, we really think about that cytokine release being the highest in the first two doses, day one and day eight, with that step in dosing. And so that's what warrants that close monitoring. The initial uh, prescribing information from the label is 22 to 24 hours on uh, days one and day eight. And if patients have any grade two or higher ICANs or CRS toxicity, they should have extended monitoring for those additional cycles. But I think, you know, once we get past that day eight, we're really seeing in our real world data that patients don't um, have the emergence of these side effects. And so I think that that should provide some comfort and ease for patients um, who might be in a community setting and those oncologists who might have, um, you know, hesitation or pause as to taking these patients either back or to starting this therapy in their center and then continuing those therapies in the outpatient setting and, and what do we do with our nurses and our staff and our infusion times and um, and how do we monitor these patients effectively. So I think if a patient demonstrates prior toxicity, you know, those are patients that should be on their radar. Your antenna should be up to watching those patients closely. Um, but if they've tolerated day one and day eight, historically, those patients are going to do well from that monitoring outpatient. And so I think that working together with your community and academic oncologists is key to provide the highest quality care for our patients and their families. Absolutely. Thanks so much for going over that. So just to summarize there, so the first cycle in general will be in the main institute and after the, uh, that has been administered at the mothership, they will follow an outpatient with community oncologists. That's the idea. And so, you know, really to have something in a hospital setting, and that's that's really the key. It doesn't have to be in an academic center, um, you know, per se, but it needs to be in an institution, um, sure. in a hospital setting that they're observed. I think as we study this more and that the data presented at ESMO IO um, right. in 2024 showed that there is some expedited outpatient monitoring yes. that could be done. And so I think we're, we're moving that direction, which would be wonderful for all of our patients. 
um, and also to be able to treat more patients with this medication, removing that rate limiting step, you know, but it really, as it currently stands in the prescribing information, you know, we are looking at that 22 to 24 hour mm -hmm. and staying within an hour of the hospital uh, in case that any events occur outside of that um, window period. I think that's the biggest logistical uh, difference that every university or the hospital is deciding how to maneuver through that. So thanks so much for going over that. Yeah. And now to what you say, whenever the topic of tarlatamab comes, um, we, the, a lot of discussion is around CRS. But again, once we have gone over this hump of logistical issues, other side effects are equally important. That is fatigue, taste changes, myalgias. And these are some of the common side effects that we would see out in community settings after we are over our CRS. Misty, any clinical pearls around these? Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting these. I think they're they're meaningful for our patients and their families. You know, really dyscusia can be pretty serious. And so monitoring it, getting catching it early and, and really being preventative and proactive. So having your patients who are on terlatumab, meeting with those patients early with dietary dietary ad, um, advice with your oncology nutritionist. That is the key, you know, adequate hydration. There's some pearls and practical management from tarlatumab that was um, provided by the investigators who studied this. But it, in my own practice, you know, really making sure that you keep it a diary, a log uh, with your patients of what things work, what things don't work, and, and to keep evolving and keep changing because it does change based on tarlatumab hitting those cluster two taste buds. And so it is meaningful, it is real, and it's, um, it's a side effect that's with this class of drugs to be expected. Um, you know, with uh, the myalgias, again, um, this is very real. It should not be dismissed and should be addressed. So also having your patients, either if you're managing their pain or if they're established with palliative care, which I highly encourage early on to help support patients to provide the highest quality of care, that additional layer support, you know, providing palliative care referrals early for, to, for patients with small cell is so meaningful and really helps them stay on treatment longer and stay out of the hospital. Um, with other, you know, events, things like fatigue, this is very real. And so getting your PT, OT, you know, getting patients um, with light exercise, pulmonary rehab to help them stay on treatment longer and not have that debility from the wear and tear of treatment, um, including torlatumab is so important. You know, the treatment here is with palliative intent. So that's supportive care, educating our patients up front to make sure that we're keeping that quality of life at the center of all this is so important. Mm -hmm. And then as we're talking about side effects, last but not least, we obviously have to keep side effects that come along with our immunotherapy agents here. Though out in the community, we've been using this now over a decade, and there are arguably better tolerated than chemotherapy. That said, every single time I'm consenting my patient for this, we have a conversation around potential common side effects like thyroid abnormalities, rash, or pneumonitis versus some rare side effects, right? CNS abnormalities, myocarditis, or nephritis. These drugs are not benign. Ms. State, before we close, any last thoughts around the recent data from ASCO 2025 or supportive care tips for our listeners when taking care of small cell lung cancer? Absolutely. So what an exciting time for small cell. You know, the landscape for treatment for first line maintenance and relapse for small cell lung cancer is rapidly changing. So checking your guidelines, checking in with any of your academic colleagues, seeing if there's any trials that we can help improve on the, the successes we've already made. We know that, you know, with Enforte, Lermonectidin in the maintenance setting should be considered, should be supported, and should be closely managed. With Tarlatumab, really, if you don't have access to it, finding the closest center that does and having a good relationship so that you can provide that opportunity for your patients or to get that at your center, because this is here to stay. Um, so I think, you know, early palliative care, early support, watching your labs closely, checking in with patients, not having a three-month follow-up, but really, you know, closely watching them, having a toxicity check, having a lab check, having them meet with your nurse practitioner, PA, or with your clinic to have, you know, a visit to make sure they're doing well on therapy, there's no new symptoms. We really want to support patients with small cell, and close monitoring is absolutely key, especially in that transition to immunotherapy and on relapsed therapies like tarlatumab. Uh, we want patients to live longer and to have these success stories, and I think that the median is continuing to change, and that tail of the curve is lifting. What an exciting time for our patients and their families. You know, we keep saying what an exciting time and we're looking at three to four month overall survival benefit. So it's not a home run, but it's a step in the right direction. Right. Like you said this, small cell lung cancer is a devastating disease. So again, any overall survival benefit here is meaningful. Missy, thanks for walking us through on what to look out for and how to manage some of these common side effects that we will see with these new indications. 
For our listeners, make sure to check out our first episode of this series, where we touch on the current treatment landscape for extensive stage small cell lung cancer. And stay tuned for that last episode where we touch on the unmet needs for this disease. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.